Ah, tis spring, the bird is on the wing. Don't be absurd, the wing is on the bird. <laughs> My mother always announced the first day of spring with those words. Every year she would deliver them to her children by phone or by card or by email. It was one of the most consistent rituals of my life. Mom died two years ago, but you can be sure that my siblings and I are still carrying on the tradition. Like mom, I love spring. I'm not a big fan of winter, even here in the North Bay where the weather is mild and the days aren't too short. I start looking for signs of spring sometime in mid-January when I start to notice the sun setting a little bit later and notice that the hills are usually quite green. In February, I notice buds on tulip trees and buckeye, and I anticipate the fields covered in bright yellow mustard. And then comes the vernal equinox, like today when the sun's rays shine directly at the equator and daylight and dark of night are nearly equal. It's spring, and I feel the hope born of nature's promise. The hope of spring feels a little tentative, though, this year. For one thing, the ongoing drought is worrisome. The fantastic rains of early winter have given way to spring-like temperatures and dry weather for the past couple of months. The prospect of more substantial rain this year is slim, and the heat is rising. At this rate, our glorious green hills will not be green long. With global climate change, we can count on spring, but we can no longer count on predictable weather patterns. We can no longer be sure when the butterflies will return or what flowers will bloom. Of course, the lingering pandemic puts a damper on things too, right? My hope of moving into an endemic virus phase is tinged with caution. And then there's the geopolitical situation that weighs on my mind with the war in Ukraine, entrenched conflicts all around the world, immigrants and refugees displaced by violence and famine and drought. It is hard to hold on to hope in the face of these situations. And still, I can't deny the joy that this spring, this season brings me. We may go through times when nothing sparks hope or joy in our lives until something breaks through. I remember a particularly grim day when my mother was struggling with dementia. I had spent the morning with her, and as I drove home, I felt crushed by the profound and irreversible changes in her being and in our relationship. I found myself in a fog of anguish and worry and tears. But as I got out of my car in my driveway, a great blue heron flew right overhead, so close that I could see its feathers and hear its wings, and it startled me right out of my despair. It was one of those moments that poet Seamus Haney says, catch the heart off guard and blow it open. In the moment, I marveled at how my despair could be lifted by something so simple, so miraculous as a bird on the wing. It reminded me that life goes on, love goes on, and my mother and I were held in a web of interconnectedness that would not let us go. It reminded me of what I can trust, what I have faith in, and that gave me hope. It's easy to use hope and faith interchangeably, but they are different. Hope is a state of expectation for a desired outcome. It can be as simple as a desire to find a good parking place, which maybe is more akin to optimism. Václav Havel describes a deeper kind of hope, which is an orientation of the heart. 
It causes us to work for something, not because it is easy or a sure thing, but because it is good. He says, it is the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Faith, on the other hand, is a sense of trust or belief in something often unseen and intangible. I think that's what Havel refers to when he says that hope's deepest roots are in the transcendental. As I understand it, faith is required in order to have hope. Now, faith is a tricky word in UU circles because it is too often associated with blind acceptance of belief by a church or government or institution that's required by a church, a government or institution of some sort. Unitarian scholar James Luther Adams asserts that everyone has faith in something. What we love, what we sacrifice for, what we tolerate, what we fight against signify our faith. And writer and meditation teacher Sharon Salzberg says, faith is the quality of the heart that impels us to seek what is constant and whole. She says that in times when we are shaken from loss or trauma or a fearful situation, we seek a context of still existing goodness, a connection to what remains unbroken. People see that connection in different, seek that condition in different ways and different places through a religious institution, meditation, sitting with loved ones in a concert hall or a redwood forest. However we seek it, however we feel it, faith, I believe, is what keeps us going through the difficult times. It is the solid ground beneath shifting sands. Now, Unitarian Universalism is a faith tradition built on shared values that undergird our principles. Yet it encourages each of us to reflect on our own personal faith as we responsibly seek truth and meaning in life. Now, in this room and in every place where you use gather, there are multiple views of God, positive and negative, Multiple religious concepts are embraced or rejected. And there are multiple sources and experiences of faith. The important thing is to examine that faith. That beautiful reading by Brian Doyle describes some of the things he loves, the things that enhance his ability to believe in what he calls the immense confusing holiness. I wonder what you have faith in. What gives you hope? I hope to have conversations about that in my time with you. Now, if you're like me, your faith has evolved over time. I'll tell you a bit about my faith development, not because this is how it should be for you, but, and that you should believe what I believe, but just to start a conversation. My faith development included growing up in a casually Christian home, discovering a sense of wonder and awe in the natural world, and finding a personal God in 12-step meetings. In college, I fell in love with the science of geology and embarked on rigorous scientific training. For years, I struggled with the dichotomy between the rational thought and my experiences with the divine. Eventually, I came to trust my experiences and my reasoning sciency brain. I now hold both pretty comfortably and move between the two, the two views of the world with ease. I've come to believe that everything is connected and precious. What I interchangeably call spirit of life, big L love, God, the great big thing, is innately good, is in all things, holds all things, and connects all things. 
I believe each of us plays a tiny but integral part in that whole. And I still have a sense of a personal God, a presence I talk to and confide with, a co-conspirator, if you will, in the quest to create, to do what is right and help create a more just and loving world. All of this, my history, my faith evolution, has led me to ministry. I felt and still feel a calling from within and without, and a pull that keeps saying, take the next step, take the next step, take the next step. I'm learning that faith must be practiced in community. As Adams puts it, a community of human dignity and equal justice. Now, it's not easy to be a community together. There will always be conflicts and times of turmoil. Yet I believe that the work we do together is holy and generative. Together, we have the power to put hope into action, to work for peace and justice, not because it is easy, but because it is good. I have faith that our small actions here will reverberate like the hint of a breeze on the spider's web or the ripples that move out from a stone cast into water. It may not be enough to turn the tide of oppression or global climate disruption or war, but then again, it might. And it will assuredly bring hope and courage to someone who needs it. In this morning's story, Frog and Toad, uh, Frog gave Toad seeds from his garden and shared his faith that they would grow. Toad learned the joy of acting in hope, of tending those things we wish to bring into the world. As Rebecca Parker asks, what if the tender existence of the divine enters into the world through places where life is at risk. And people must come together to create ways to tend life with care so it will survive. To tend life with care so it will survive. You put your faith to work in this congregation and the larger world by tending that which you love. Together, you sustain a house of hope which was handed to you and which you will pass on to later generations. And in doing that, you give me hope and deepen my faith in the underlying goodness of the world. Recently, I was reading one of my favorite theologians, Rob Brezhny, you know, the guy who writes those weekly horoscopes? Any of you see those? I love the way he thinks about the big questions of life. The other day, he reminded me of Rabbi Mark Gelman's idea that there are only four basic prayers. Gimme, thanks, oops, and wow. <laughs> Recently, uh, now, Brashley suggests adopting a fifth prayer. Do you need assistance? He says, the creator always needs collaborators to help implement the gritty details of the latest divine schemes. In other words, how can I, how can each of us conspire with the great big thing, the spirit of life or the best of human nature to bring more love into the world? What can I do right here today with the tools I have to improve the lives of those around me? Even small gestures count. For those who have built this faith tradition, for those who share it with us now, for those who come after us, let us give thanks. For the hope of spring and the hopes that can only be realized in community, let us give thanks. Let us rest deep, root deep in our faith. Today and every day, let us be co-conspirators in creating a more just, equitable, 
and peaceful world. Amen.